morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. To continue our reading now and discussion of the book Footprints of the Jesuits by Ignatius Loyola. Conquering the world for the Pope, that's what the mission of the Jesuit order is. And they're very astute soldiers, a militia, uh, a, an army of warriors dedicated to subjecting the whole world to a global sovereign. And that they intend to be the Pope of Rome. Uh, well on their way to fully conquest, full conquest. And uh, that's the New World Order, by the way. Uh, you heard President George W. Bush talk about the, the, the George H. W. Bush talk about the New World Order, but he didn't tell you what it was. Uh, we know what it is. It's a global religion, a global government, and a global economic system headed up by one supreme sovereign, governor of the world, and it's the Pope of Rome. The Biblical, Historical, and Prophetic Antichrist. Now, we're talking about the early days, the earliest days of the Jesuit order, and its foundation and formation by Ignatius Loyola, a Basque Spaniard, a military man who had his privilege in the courts. Uh, He was a blue blood and uh, was not a highly educated man, but very loyal and astute in, in ways of military. And he knew that in order to uh, restore the temporal power of the Pope after having been uh, removed of that power after the Protestant Reformation, it took, it took a team of unquestioning loyalty to the Jesuit general to get it done. And we're talking now about the original constitution that Ignatius Loyola wrote to govern this society of Jesus, so-called, the Jesuit order. And beginning on page 39 of the book, the first full paragraph, if you're following along in your own copy, it says, There was nothing in the original Jesuit constitution necessary to the Christian faith or to the established doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, remember, this is a military establishment. It's not interested in do- doctrine or dogma or the Christian faith. This is the original intent of the, the Jesuit order to leave all of that to the church and just be the special forces of the Roman Catholic Church to, to uh, increase the temporal power of the Pope all over the world. Now, it, it, meaning the Constitution, provided for the organization of a select body of men united together professedly to maintain what Loyola chose to call the greater glory of God, ad majorum de glorium, ad majorum de glorium. That's Latin for the greater glory of God by such undefined methods as might be from time to time made known to him by their general, and without fixing any limitation or restraint upon either his discretion or authority. So the Jesuit general is going to have unquestioned authority, and that the soldiers underneath him, the the Jesuits under his charge, would divorce themselves of any intellect whatsoever, and that they would do instinctively, immediately, without question, without equivocation, whatever the Jesuit told them to do. Ignatius Loyola demanded complete, total, and instantaneous obedience from his from his soldiers, the Jesuits. Now, there was no pretense of adding to or taking from the settled doctrines or dogmas of the church, for that could have been done only by the Pope or by the general council or by the two powers acting conjointly in unity. It would have been a a direct censure of the church 
to have assumed the necessity of this or to have solicited authority to undertake it, equivalent to saying that it had failed to provide the necessary means of maintaining the true faith after many centuries of unlimited power. So Ignatius Loyola was going to go out of his way to make sure that the Jesuit order completely stayed out of the affairs of the church as far as the Christian faith is concerned. Again, reiterating that Loyola's company, the company of Jesus or the Society of Jesus, was not going to meddle in religious affairs, but was going to conquer the world for the Pope and restore his temporal power all over the world. And it said it was the duty of Ignatius Loyola as a faithful son of the church, no less than it was the duty of those who were less pretentious, to have regarded its faith and doctrines as already perfect, to have regarded the Roman Catholic Church's faith and doctrines as already perfect. Okay? So the point is well made. Now it says to have done otherwise, that is to have meddled in the religious dogma of the Roman Catholic Church, would have given aid and comfort to Luther and the Reformation. Okay, there was nothing about the Jesuit order that was supposed that was uh, could be construed as any kind of support for Martin Luther and the other Protestant reformers in the Protestant Reformation. So. Even acknowledging, as Loyola did, that there were reforms needed in the Roman Catholic Church, he was not going to support Martin Luther or the Reformation. Now it says, hence his pretenses, uh, his pretense of the necessity for the organization of a new society or order with special methods, methods of its own hitherto unknown clearly indicated a desire to act apart from and independently of the existing methods and authorities of the church. So this is going to be a unique society, brand new to the world and especially to the Roman Catholic Church. And it says, no matter however what pretenses were made by Ignatius Loyola or what his secretly cherished designs were, there's not the least ground for doubt that his method of establishing and organizing a new society had no relations whatsoever to the principles of the Christian faith. In other words, that the existing methods were competent for all practical and necessary purposes without it. It was consequently temporal merely. That is, it had reference exclusively to the management of men so as to reduce them to uninquiring obedience to such authority as was set over them. There was nothing besides this which the church and the ancient monastic orders did not already possess the power to accomplish. The exercises, he's talking about the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola that we've talked about here on the program before, these exercises that he prescribed were, it is true, spiritual in character, such as penance and mortification of the flesh. But the church had already provided these, and they were rigorously observed by the monastic orders. The pledge to employ them, made by the members of the Society of Jesus so as to promote their own spiritual welfare, was merely incidental to the duty they already owed to the church. Consequently, while these spiritual exercises conform to the existing obligations imposed by the church, the new society projected by Ignatius Loyola was intended to furnish the machinery necessary for exacting obedience, for training and disciplining all who would be influenced by it for that single purpose. And in order to accomplish effectively this obedience to himself, and his new society, leaving out entirely both the church and the pope, he originally de- uh, <clears throat> he originally designed that the members of the society should be responsible alone to the general, from whom from whom all laws and regulations for their government should emanate. The pope, as the head of the church, 
had not the least authority over these members conferred upon him by the original Constitution, nor was it intended that they should obey any other authority than that of the general, because he and he alone was recognized as the sole representative of God upon the earth. Now this is where the Jesuits differ from many of the other monastic orders. The Jesuits, according to the original constitution as written by Ignatius Loyola, were to have their first and only loyalty to Ignatius Loyola, and they were to regard him as the voice of God on earth. And they were to ignore all other voices, including the Pope and the Church. <clears throat> Ignatius Loyola wanted the Jesuits to be his army. And they want, and he wanted the Jesuits to respond to him and him only. That was in the original constitution of the Jesuits. Now you might well imagine that the Pope, the so-called vicar of Christ on earth, the governor of the world, the divine right governor of the world, wouldn't look kindly upon Ignatius Loyola having his own army and uh, and and secret operations uh, and uh, and not being uh, under the authority of the Pope. And that's where we're headed here. And he said there was nothing spiritual in all this, in the sense in which the Church had defined spiritual things and the Christian world understood them, but it made the society as Loyola planned it, temporal merely, a mere police corps, drilled and disciplined to obedience alone, without, without the right either to inquire or decide whether the commands of their superior were right or wrong. Okay? This is what you call unquestioned obedience. No Jesuit was ever to question the Jesuit general or to ascertain within himself whether or not the, the Jesuit general was right or wrong. <clears throat> this is the level of, of control that most people have to struggle to comprehend. Now it says, It should surprise no intelligent man, therefore, at learning the fact that the Pope hesitated about giving the society his approval, when Loyola first requested his pontifical ratification of its constitution. That Loyola's original intention was that his new society should exact from its members a pledge of, of fidelity alone to himself and those who should succeed him in his government and not to the church or to the pope is plainly to be seen in the fact that when he found a new sim uh, when he found a few sympathizing friends to unite with him, he did not submit the plan of organization to the Pope for approval so as to make it a religious order like the Dominicans or the Franciscans or other ancient orders, but sought only from him permission for himself and his friends to go as missionaries to the Holy Land to labor for the conversion of the infidel Turks to Christianity. Okay? So, as long as he got permission to go to the Holy Land as missionaries, he wasn't even going to show the Pope the Constitution of the Jesuits. <laughs> now, this is duplicity. You know, just remember, this is not a religious organization. This is a military organization. And they're, they're getting signed off by the Pope proclaiming themselves to be missionaries, and they're going to convert the Turks over to quote-unquote Christianity, which, which means Catholicism. So they're expecting to get the, the approval of the Pope for this missionary mission, but they've got other things up their sleeves. Ignatius Loyola is a military man, not a missionary. Okay? What do you suppose Ignatius Loyola had in mind for the Turks? We we would call them Muslims today. <laughs> and you think the Jesuits have any control over the Muslims today? I do. I think they have a lot of control over the Muslims today. And they're orchestrating that body of so-called heretics against the United States of America, a nation of heretics, liberal Catholics, 
Protestants, infidels, according to the papacy, and they pitted them against one another in war. And it's all over Jerusalem, too. And now I could launch into another sermon about futurism, but I'll stick with the program this morning. And uh, But if you continue to listen to Inquisition Update, you'll be able to do your own math. And what what Ignatius Loyola really has in mind with regard to the Muslims in the world today. Now it says that he, Ignatius Loyola, then contemplated acting in so far as the movements and operations of his society were concerned, independently of the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope, is evident by the most undoubted authority. The, the author of a work entitled Lives of the Saints, a work which was of the highest endorsement, says, quote, In 1534, on the Feast of Assumption of Our Lady, St. Ignatius and his six companions, of whom Francis Xavier was one, made a vow at Montmartre to visit the Holy Land and unite their labors for the conversion of the infidels, or, if this should be found not practicable, to cast themselves at the feet of the Pope and offer their services wherever he thought fit to employ them." Unquote. So, so offering themselves as servants to the Pope and being obedient to the Pope, was only a last-ditch effort. Okay? That was not the original intent of Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola wanted the approval of the Pope to do whatever he wanted to do. But that's as far as the loyalty to the papacy then existed. All right? Now, it'll be seen, therefore that it was entirely conditional whether or no Ignatius Loyola would make known to the Pope his new society and the plan of its organization and ask his pontifical approval. He had already formed the primary organization and ab obtained from Xavier and his five other associates the necessary vow of obedience by which they had placed themselves entirely under his dominion and control. If it should prove, quote-unquote, practicable for him to plant his new and independent society in the Holy Land, which presented a large and tempting field of operations, it was undoubtedly his secret, secretly cherished purpose to do so without making his constitution known to the Pope and thus to establish in Asia an organization independent of the Pope and submissive only to himself. Now, does that add any understanding to what role the Jesuits are now playing among the Muslim world? They are organizing this, this uh, antagonistic Muslim horde that is supposedly a threat to the United States and is challenging of the existence of the right of the Jews to live in Israel. That's what the Jesuits are doing. Now, Ignatius Loyola originally planned to go to the Middle East, go to Israel, or to go to Palestine, and quote-unquote... Uh, do missionary work among the Turks, imagine what Ignatius Loyola had up his sleeve. Now, remember, <clears throat> we're talking about the year 1534. The papacy had already launched crusade after crusade after crusade warring with the Turks and trying desperately to gain control of the quote-unquote Holy Land, and particularly Jerusalem. The papacy, which I call the vicar of Satan on the earth, wishes to fulfill the prophecy, the false prophecy of Luth Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. 
I, I, you, I like to put it this way to some, <clears throat> some of my listeners. There's no greater Zionist in all the world than the papacy, the vicar of Satan. He wishes to rule from Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. He wishes to sit in God's throne. Remember, it was Satan who tempted Jesus in the, in the wilderness in his 40 day of uh, temptation. You think Satan's interested in controlling Jerusalem? Certainly, the Pope is interested in controlling Jerusalem. That's common knowledge. That's common knowledge. Now, Ignatius Loyola knew of the importance of Jerusalem and the Middle East to the papacy. And I think, I think Ignatius, Ignatius Loyola's original intent was to develop an organization, a militia in Asia for the purpose of gaining control, military conquest of Jerusalem so that the, he could just hand it over to the Pope on a silver platter and be hailed the savior of the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, after all, he was a military man. He wanted to take credit for the operations. He wanted to take personal credit for the operations of the Jesuit order. And keeping his plan of operations completely secret from the Pope. His focus of attention early on was the Middle East. Now, you may differ in your opinions with me, but it's certainly interesting to contemplate what Ignatius Loyola's original intent was for the for the Society of Jesus. And the question needs to be asked today. Did they ever really abandon Ignatius Loyola's original design for the for the Jesuit order? Is the Middle East still the focus of their attention? It's unquestioned that it was originally the the intent of Ignatius Loyola to seat his operations in the Middle East. And I maintain it's still uh, the aim of the Jesuit order to conquer, to capture Jerusalem and hand it over to the papacy. Now, it says, but if found to be not practicable, then and only then he and his companions would cast themselves at the feet of the Pope and offer their services to him and to the church. Okay? If they failed in Ignatius Loyola's original intent, original purpose for the Jesuit order, then and only then would they submit themselves to the Pope and the church. So right here you have to recognize the Jesuits have an agenda. Secret though it may be, it is completely different from the agenda of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the, the, the Jesuits have been regarded, even by the papacy, as a bull moose in a china shop, reckless and dangerous, even to the point of at one time the Pope suppressing the Jesuit order because of popular demand for their dissolution. And the Jesuits have an agenda, a global agenda. And we'll talk more about it when we get back from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
In this day of economic uncertainty and soaring unemployment, safe investments are often hard to find. But investing in the precious metals is the safest investment of all because gold and silver is real money. Government printed currency is not. Call Melody Cedars from a discount gold and silver trading company at 1-800-375-4188. Melody has been helping people secure their financial future for over 10 years. While others in the business claim honesty, Melody will deliver. Give her a call, 1-800-375-4188. That's 800-375-4188. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left-behind rapture answers for us, Don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin, Rapture Origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America, in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book. The rapture will be canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The rapture will be canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. If you like Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. And we thank Brother Nicholas for seeing the value of Inquisition Update. Now back to the book, Footprints of the Jesuits by R.W. Thompson. R.W. Thompson, Secretary of the U.S. Navy, has just revealed to us that Ignatius Loyola had a secret plan of operations for the Middle East, independent of the popes. And he, he asserts that Ignatius Loyola wanted to establish in Asia an organization independent of the Pope and submissive only to himself. Okay? Completely independent of the Pope. The Pope would have no authority whatsoever over this organization and would not be privy privy to its operations. Completely independent of the papacy. They were going on a quote-unquote missionary journey, posing as missionary, but remember, this is a militia. They're not going to meddle in religious affairs. <laughs> You're starting to get a picture of uh, the duplicity of the Jesuit order. Now it says, speaking of this so-called missionary journey to the Middle East, he says, but if found to be not practicable, then and only then, he and his companions would, quote, cast themselves at the feet of the Pope and offer their services, unquote, to him and to the church. So if Ignatius Loyola floundered on his fledgling uh, journey to the Middle East to do whatever it was that he intended to do, which he alone knew, if he was thwarted, if some unfortunate Unfortune, uh, misfortune befell him, then and only then would he submit himself to the Pope and to the Church. Alright, his military ambition, not yet 
extinguished. Remember, he is a military man. He has no other training, no other education than to be a military man. He says his military ambition, not yet extinguished, was manifestly kindled afresh by the hope that a whole continent would be would be open before him where he would find the oriental methods of obedience strictly consistent with with those he desired to introduce and where he could create unmolested such influences as being introduced into Europe might counteract those already produced by the Reformation. So he already knows about the mentality of the people that he will be uh, working with in Asia and their level of discipline would be conducive to them handing over their intellect or surrendering their intellect and doing unquestioningly whatever Ignatius Loyola says to do. He was going to take advantage of the disciplinary, of the discipline of the indigenous people of this region and to build an organization that would serve him and him alone. And only if that failed would he submit to the Roman Catholic Church. And it's, and, and all of this was an intent to counteract what was produced by the Protestant Reformation. What, what did the Protestant Reformation produce? Independent thinking. Independent reading of the Bible. Independent, well look, everybody submitted themselves to Christ individually. They no longer submitted themselves to the Pope. They no longer subscribed to the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church. They found liberty in Christ. And they learned of him. And they were submissive to him individually. Ignatius Loyola, in order to control the world, must have a global collective, right? He has to restore the old world order, the old world mentality, where you surrender your manhood, your intellect, your will, your speech, your thought, your conscience, over to somebody else, the Pope in this case. Ignatius Loyola loves that system where mankind is reduced to an imbecile and allows another man to do all the thinking for you, to to write on your conscience, to control your very thought, word, and deed, and all of it for the purpose of destroy all, all the efforts Ignatius Loyola expended were for the purpose of destroying the liberty that the Protestants had in Christ and submit them once again to the tyrant, the Pope of Rome. Now he says his military ambition, not yet extinguished, was manifestly kindled afresh by the hope that a whole continent would be opened before him where he would find the oriental methods of obedience strictly consistent with those he desired to introduce, and where he could create unmolested such influences as being introduced into Europe might counteract those already produced by the Protestant Reformation. But not until he found that he was balked in this did he intend to devote himself and his companions to the immediate work of attempting to arrest the progress of the Protestant Reformation in Europe, where the existing methods of resisting it were not under his control. So he wanted to control the effort to overthrow, to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And it says it was worthy of the founder of Ignatius Loyola to solicit the Pope's approval for this great missionary scheme and to conceal from him at the same time his secret purpose to act in the name of a new society adverse to the ancient monastic orders and submissive to himself alone. Okay? He's going to present himself as a friend of the papacy, but in fact he has other designs. He's going to elevate himself to a pope. Okay? And that's what he is. That's why he's called the Black Pope. 
Now it says that this concealment was studied and premeditated. There can be no reasonable doubt. And as it was the first step taken by Ignatius Loyola in the execution of his plan, he thereby practiced such duplicity and deceit toward the church and the pope that these qualities may well be considered as fundamental to the society of Jesus, the society of the Jesuits. Deceit and duplicity. It began under these under under these terms, deceit and duplicity. While on the one hand he pretended to be a friend of the papacy, he had secret designs for his orders, uh, for his, his military order of the Jesuits, that history will prove ran counter to the to the uh, papacy. And it says, and there is ample proof in the strange and eventful history of this society that it has been from the time from that time until the present consistently faithful to this example of its founder deceit and duplicity that's how you describe the jesuit order deceit and duplicity if the jesuit's mouth is moving he's lying or he's equivocating or he's exercising casuistry and sophistry He's never a truth teller. Now it says his first successes were doubtless flattering to the pride as well as encouraging to the hopes of Ignatius Loyola. Having succeeded in obtaining the consent of the Pope that he and his companions should become missionaries to the Holy Land without having revealed the existence or character of his society, they were all ordained as priests for that purpose as none of them had been previously admitted to the priesthood. Remember, this is a military organization, not a priesthood. They're not involved in religion. They only became priests in order to convince the Pope that they wanted to go on a missionary journey. Okay? Making themselves priests was just another tool in their drawer. Okay? Another tool in their toolbox. They're not meddling, they're not interested in religion, they're interested in a military operation. And becoming priests was just a requirement <clears throat> at that time to get the approval of the Pope to inject themselves into the Middle East. Now, thus equipped as priests, They took their departure for Palestine with the plan and principles of their organization locked up in their own minds and the ultimate design of their ambition, lead uh, their ambitious leader known probably to himself alone. They must have commenced their journey with joyful hearts and rapturous hopes, which soon, however, became chilled by what Loyola must have considered a sad misfortune, probably the first he had encountered, had encountered since he had received a wound at the Battle of Pampeluna, which disfigured his person so that he could share no longer in the gay festivities of the royal court. Okay, he was shot by a cannonball. It passed between his knees and and shattered one leg and damaged, severely damaged the other. And he walked with a limp. He was no longer a pretty boy, as you might say today. And he was unfit to serve in the court. Of the, of the king, okay, he was a blue blood, but so long, but no longer. I mean, he was damaged goods, so so he had to find another occupation, and this is what he chose to do. And he says they were prevented from reaching Palestine by the war then in progress between Emperor Charles V and the Turks. And after an absence of about a year, were compelled to return to Europe disheartened as may well be supposed by their failure. This put a new aspect upon the fortunes of Ignatius Loyola. His first advance toward independence and acquisition of power had accomplished nothing favorable to his ambition, and consequently it became necessary for him to discover some more promising field of operations where no such mishap as he had encountered would be likely to occur again. 
There was abundant room in Europe for missionary labor, but he was now for the first time confronted by the fact that his society could not engage in this work in the presence of numerous religious orders already in existence without obtaining for it the express approval of the Pope, so that by this means it might be also stamped with a religious character insofar as that approval would confer it. He manifestly had not calculated upon a crisis which would make it necessary to submit the provisions of his constitution to the Pope, or to make them known to any others besides those who were to become members of his society and were willing to yield up their manhood so completely as to vow uninquiring obedience and submission to him and his successors as the only representatives and vicegerents of God upon the earth. It cannot be supposed that a man of such sagacity as he undoubtedly possessed would not have foreseen the difficulty of obtaining the approval of the Pope to a constitution which humiliated him by assigning higher authority to the Jesuit general of a new society, the Jesuits, than the church had confided in t to him that is, to the Pope. And says, but he had gone too far to retreat and had too much courage to attempt it, for his courage was never doubted, either upon the battlefield or elsewhere, and when he found it absolutely necessary to visit Rome in order to obtain the Pope's sanction, he did so, accompanied by Lefebvre and Lainez, two of his companions. Before their departure, however, from Vicenza in, Austri in Austrian Italy, <clears throat> where they were assembled, Ignatius Loyola deemed it important to announce to his followers, probably for the first time, the name he had decided to give his society. He thus instructed them, quote, To those who ask what we are, we will reply, We are the soldiers of the Holy Church and we form the Society of Jesus, unquote. It's kind of late in the game to be naming this organization after Jesus, isn't it? I mean, after all, it was intended for originally not to be a religious order, but to be a military order. But having been thwarted in his original duplicitous, deceitful mission to, to the Middle East, he had to acquiesce and gain permission of the Pope. He had to expose his constitution to the Pope. And he had to take on a religious flavor. And so he named his company, this military organization, the Society of Jesus. And the Jesuits ever since then have hidden under a cloak of Christianity. But trust me when I tell you, and when you do your own research and investigation into the Jesuit order, they are not Christians. Okay? Not even Christians according to the Roman Catholic measure of Christianity. They worship Lucifer. Okay? You might reel back at that one and think, whoa, he's gone too far now. Yeah, they worship Lucifer. As we, as was revealed in the book Code Word Barbalon by P.D. Stewart. P.D. Stewart said one of the most frequent guests of the Jesuit order for speaking engagements was Anton LaVey. <laughs> yeah, they're fascinated with Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. Why? Because they both worship Satan. That's why. P.D. Stewart made it absolutely clear that the Jesuits, according to their laws and according to their morality, may use the mechanics of Satan to accomplish their end. Remember, the Jesuit motto is, the end justifies the means. All right, their end, their desired end is a global conquest for a single man, to rule the world by the volition of a single man. That is the aim and goal and purpose of the Jesuit order. That is their desired end. So, what is lawful to do in order to achieve that end? Virtually anything, and that is to make league with Satan himself in order to accomplish it. 
The end justifies the means. So that's how they operate. And it says, after naming the society of Jesus, taking on this cloak of religiosity, this cloak of Christianity, it says, this was evidently suggested by the necessities which then confronted him. All right? Taking on the name of Jesus for this society was just an, an expedient thing to do. It had the Jesuits had to get the confidence of the Pope and the Christian Church and the and the Catholic Church. Oh, I did it myself, didn't I? They had to gain the confidence of the Antichrist, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, and the Church of Satan. All right. So they took on the name of. Jesus, the Society of Jesus, now known as the Jesuit Order. And it says, he had not found it expedient to adopt such a designation or to announce that they were, quote, soldiers of the Holy Church, unquote, until their attempt to obtain an independent position in Palestine had failed. So again, R.W. Thompson is concentrating our F, our, 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 uh, uh, our minds to the reality that the Jesuits never intended to be a religious order like the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and, and the, the Capuchins and the rest of them. They wanted to be a military order. They only became priests because it was expedient for their purposes. They only revealed their constitution to the Pope to gain his approval because it was an expedient to their purposes. They only took on the name of Jesus as the society of Jesus because it was an expedient to their purposes. He says, therefore, these avowals made before going to Rome are justly to be considered as mere expedients suggested by the necessity of obtaining the Pope's approval. The, ex the existing religious orders had taken their names from their founders, but Ignatius' profane use of the sacred name of the Son of God clearly indicated that he intended to set up for his society a claim of holiness superior to all others. Or it was assumed as a cover for practices contemplated by him that would not bear inspection in the light. Let me read it again. Comprehend what R.W. Thompson's saying. He either, he either cre uh, created this order to be the most holy of all of the monastic orders of the Roman Catholic Church, or it was assumed the name of Jesus, the Society of Jesus, or it was assumed as a cover for practices contemplated by him, Ignatius Loyola, that would not bear inspection in the light. That's it. It's not a religious order. It's certainly not a Christian order. It's a military order, and it hides under the cloak of the name of Jesus. Now, if you, you talk to you talk to a Roman Catholic about the Jesuits, you tried to get them to talk a little bit about the Jesuits. Oh man, they're holy. They're the holiest of all. I mean, they 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 are so holy. Ignatius Loyola did more miracles than Jesus Christ himself. And the Jesuit order has preserved the Roman Catholic Church and, and, and did yada, 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 yada. They've got this glowing impression of the quote-unquote Christianity of the Jesuit order, the sacred name of Jesus, and on and on and on. And the fact is they have never, never, sought Jesus Christ or anything to do with him. They have an ulterior motive. And we're seeing it materialize in the world today. And the world still believes that the Jesuits are a Christian society. And that's how ignorant the world is in our generation. R.W. Thompson continues, he says, that it was intended as a reflection upon the ancient monastic orders then existing and to express superior, superiority over them cannot be doubted. Okay? This is the reason why they took on the name Society of Jesus. Because they were going to dominate the other monastic orders who took their name simply from their founders. They, none of them had the gall 
to take the name of Jesus for their society. But not the Jesuits. They brazenly take on the name of Jesus and deceive the whole world. He says, in any view, to say the least, it was impudent and presumptuous and was generally offensive to the Christian world. That's right. When they announced themselves as the Society of Jesus, the world recoiled. In other words, you got to be kidding, right? You're taking on the name of Jesus? No other monastic order in the whole Roman Catholic Church ever dared to take on the name of Jesus. But you do. Okay? And it's just a cloak. It's just a cloak to hide, to, to, to conceal the most diabolical organization on the planet. An organization that has been reviled by every nation on the planet except the United States of America. An organization that was reviled even by the papacy and was extinguished and exterminated by a papal bull. And I implore my listeners not to just rely upon my voice, but to do your own research into the history of the Jesuit order and see for yourself what their true purpose in the world is. Now he continues, he says, At the time of Loyola's visit to Rome, Paul III was Pope. When his approval of the new society was solicited, he deemed it indispensable as a measure of precaution that the question should be investigated with the greatest care. For until then, no opportunity had been afforded him of knowing the ultimate purposes of Ignatius Loyola or the machinery that he had constructed for executing them. Whether the Pope suspected him of concealment or not is impossible now to tell but that he had reason to do so is evident from the most favorable accounts given of the original original official interview between them. Then it was that the Pope was apprised for the first time that the Constitution under which the Society of the Jesuits had been organized required a solemn vow by which all the members were pledged to implicit and unquestioning obedience to their superior, that is, the Jesuit general. That's when the Pope finally found out what the Jesuit order was really all about. And we've run out of time. We'll continue with the reading and discussion of the book Footprints of the Jesuits by R.W. Thompson on the program Monday. Please pray for me and First Amendment Radio. We'll see you next time. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, Don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, 
the rapture will be canceled. That's crossthebordor.org. 